Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. He is our Abba. Praise God. Glory to God. He takes care of all of our needs. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it today. Father, we thank you for all that you are and all that you do and all that you mean to us. We bless you this morning and praise you and thank you, Lord, for every good and perfect gift. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give him a hand. Praise God. Thank the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise God. And uh, just as a, I don't know, heads up, we weren't exposed to uh, any of these minions. <laughs> yes, you just left out that part just in case. Uh, the last time we were around them was a Halloween party. Uh, and, uh, That's scary. It's, it's spooky, but but we're all good and uh, praise the Lord. So uh, no issues. God's with them. In fact, the littlest one uh, is a year and a half, and she was only sick for a day or so, and she's fine. Her her grandmother, our daughter, my stepdaughter, in law, is uh, is the one that's dealing with it. And she's at home, but. She, you know, she's fine for a little bit, and then she'll have a headache or something. You know, it just kind of comes and goes. It's not like it's totally debilitating. But anyway, uh, it's the world we live in, but God is in charge, and uh, amen. They may get exposed to things. That doesn't mean we have to succumb to it. So praise God. What do you call a fly without wings? A walk. <laughs> what did the pirate say on his 80th birthday? Hi, matey. <laughs> All right. How do you think the unthinkable? With an iceberg. <laughs> iceberg. She got it. <laughs> Just kind of took a long way around, didn't it? Praise the Lord. You know, there's only three kinds of people in the world. People who are good at math and people who aren't. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Just like there are two kinds of people in there are ten kinds of people that understand binary. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, listen. Uh, it is great time of the year, and uh, Thanksgiving, and of course, it's, it's it'll be weird because. We won't have as many of the big gatherings as we've always had in the past, although I think we're still going to have some family over, only those who are sick. But, uh, just to spit in the devil's eye, you know. But I want to read a couple of things to you, and uh, these have been out there for a long, th uh, long time. But this first one is uh, it's entitled, uh, Beliefs Held by Our Founding Fathers. Now, I'm not going to try to make it sound like our our country has been perfect in everything, because obviously we know there's been flaws and issues, but it's still the greatest nation on this earth as far as I'm concerned. And uh, even with its flaws and the things that we're trying to work through even today. But George Washington, this is a proclamation that he gave on Thanksgiving of 1789. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. When are we going to hear that? to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And whereas both houses of the Congress have by their joint committee requested me to com recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent or the beneficent author of all the good that was and that is and that will be, that we may be then all to unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country, previous to their becoming a nation, for the signal and manifold mercies and the favorable interpositions of his providence in the course and conclusion of the late war, 
for the great decree of tranquility, union, and plenty which we have since enjoyed, for the peaceable and rational manner in which we have been enabled to establish constitutions of government for our safety and happiness, and particularly the national one now lately instituted for the civil and religious liberties with which we are blessed, and the means we have of acquiring and diffusing useful knowledge and in general for all the great and various favors which he has been pleased to confer upon us. And also that we may then unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions to enable us all, whether in public or private stations, to perform our several and relative duties properly and punctually, to render our national government a blessing to all the people by constantly being a government of wise, just, and constitutional laws, discreetly and faithfully executed and obeyed, to protect and guide all sovereigns and nations, especially such as have shown kindness to us, and to bless them with good governments, peace, and concord, to promote the knowledge and practice of the true religion and virtue and the increase of science among them and us, and generally to grant unto all mankind such a degree of temporal prosperity as he alone knows to be best. George Washington, October 1789. And then Abraham Lincoln, a proclamation of thanksgiving by President Abraham Lincoln. And this is uh, 1863, and it's leading up to his actual proclamation of thanksgiving, of the day of thanksgiving. And it, he is speaking then, and he says, it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God. Amen. To confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, that those nations are blessed whose God is the Lord. <clears throat> We know that by his divine law, nations, like individuals, are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now des desolates the land, may be a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We've been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We've grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. And then this is dated Abe Lincoln, March 1863. Then in October 1863, Abraham Lincoln gave this short address. It has seemed to me fit and proper that God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those at sea and those in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in heaven. As I said, there have been many flaws and issues in this great country we live in. And we are well aware of the bigotry and hatred and all sorts of things that have happened. But yet, this nation is built on equality. Whether they understood that in the beginning or not, doesn't matter. I believe God, I mean, it does matter, but it doesn't matter in terms of the truth of what they stood for because it came from the Lord. We're still sorting out some of these things, but I'm telling you, when, as Abraham Lincoln said, we just 
It's, it's a shame that we have to set a day aside. That we don't just recognize that this is something we should do every day. Yes. To be thankful and to give thanks for everything that God has done and is doing and will continue to do. Amen. Things, that we, things that we won't know even happened until we're in heaven. That's right. Things that God has done in our lives to protect us and yes. provide for us that we never saw his hand in it. Yes. We just saw the result <clears throat> of it. The fact that we were born in this country yes. is a blessing from God. Oh. I mean, I know we're looking at things today and it's, you know, it's, it's weird and it's strange and it's stupefying in some ways. But still, I can't imagine living in any other country in the world. And I've been to some of them. This is the best as far as I'm concerned. Does, again, it doesn't mean we're not flawed. It just means God has been with this country and blessed it in so many ways. Yes, Jesus' name. So, with that in mind, let's go to the scriptures. I want to start with uh, Matthew uh, Jeff, uh, chapter 15. Matthew 15, and uh, beginning at verse 21. Matthew 15, verse 21. Again, I want to thank uh, Tim and uh, as always, doing a great job and uh, setting things up perfectly for me because the things that he's talking about are always what I end up talking about, too. And uh, Suzanne and uh, Peter for leading us in worship. Suzanne and Mike for doing all the things that they do every day and especially on Sundays. We appreciate them. And all of you for being here. And everybody's out there on the Internet with us uh, on Facebook and uh, live streaming. We appreciate you. And uh, just just believe you're a part of this service amen we don't we're grateful to people that are here physically but you're here spiritually and that's what matters god has brought us together amen for this purpose uh, to be one in the body of christ and uh, so praise the lord for that and god bless all of you for being out there and happy thanksgiving to you so in matthew chapter 15 verse 21 he said then jesus went thence and departed under the coasts of tyre and sidon and i want to read through verse 28 if i didn't already tell you that peter Matthew 15, 21 through 28. So Jesus went thence and departed under the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, my uh, O son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away. She crieth after us. But he answered and said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And then John 6, 35. John 6, 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. And he that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And finally, Romans 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that's really a quote from Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, I think it is, uh, the first two or three verses. And he's talking about a vision, a word from the Lord. And he said, just hang on. It has to come to pass. And the just will live by faith. So... We see the power of a crumb with this woman uh, whose daughter is sorely vexed, it says, with a demon. She cried out to Jesus and she followed him and they tried to avoid her. She stayed in their way. The words she finally heard from the disciples and then from Jesus were words of dismissal. He even called her a dog. Some of you struggling with an answered prayer or unanswered prayer. <coughs> It could be worse. But she should have been insulted. 
She could have gotten mad. She could have been disappointed, full of doubt, and all of that could have just overwhelmed her. She could have just left and become bitter, but her daughter would have never gotten better. Instead, her faith hung on. She heard more than what was just spoken. She wasn't asking for a meal with the children. She would be satisfied with one crumb of truth scattered and fallen to the floor under the, ma under the master's table left for the dogs to lick up. She heard the talk of dogs and she seized the crumb. What she was saying to Jesus was simple. Lord, my faith in you is such that if one crumb is all I get, it'll be enough to heal my daughter. If there's enough power in one crumb to heal a sick daughter, if there's enough power in one crumb that an outcast Gentile woman received a whatsoever you want is yours response. How much more power? is in the whole loaf. Yes. If he'll do that for a dog with just one crumb, right. what's he willing and wanting to do for us, his children, who come to his table and have access to the bread of life? Yes. We've got more than crumbs, church. Yes. We are better than dogs, church. We are his chosen generation. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Thank you, Jesus. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Praise the Lord. So based on what this woman who had no right to the bread received, she had a devil-chasing divine healing experience in the life of her child. Can we even comprehend what's available to us as spirit-born children of God? If he do this for a dog, how much more is he wanting to give his children? You know, under the, oh, the old, in the old days how it used to be, and I, I suspect it may still be in a lot of homes today, when the master or the head of the house ate, no animals were in the house. It was just him and whoever the family was or whoever was there to eat. And once they were finished eating, the master would leave and then they would let the puppies or the dogs come and they'd lick up the stuff that was on the floor. It was part of their little treat, I suppose, but he was never interacting with the animals, with the puppies or with the dogs or any of that stuff. So that's where that, all, that whole attitude or that idea come from. But there's power in a crumb, a power in a crumb to remove disease, he tells us. There is power in a crumb to relieve every affliction. There is power in a crumb to drive out every bit of depression. There's power in a crumb to break the bondage of every oppressing spirit. There's power in a crumb to lift every burden, physical, mental, and spiritual. He is the bread of life. And he is able. Yes. Hebrews 13 and 8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As he was that we read in Luke, he's exactly the same today. Nothing has changed. Whatever he was doing then, he's still doing now. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he's done, he can do, and he will do it again. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. 1 Corinthians 2 and 9.
But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And that scripture is not talking about something out in the eternity, out after we're dead and gone, after we're in heaven. It refers to the saints right here and now, the believers in God in this temporal life. He has done things, he has provided things that we have no clue about. They're there, they're available to us, we just have to have faith to receive it. We don't have to die and go to heaven to experience this. We just have to believe it in order to receive it here and now. Humanly speaking, we, we live in a, t you know, we, we traffic in time. Everything we do is controlled by time. You know, from the time you're born till the time you die. Uh, a work week, uh, hours in the day that you work, and everything is, everything is a time-focused thing, right? But because of that, we're troubled by tests. We're troubled by trials. We have tribulations. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus says to us, your eyes haven't seen what I've got waiting for you, what's available for you right here and now in this place where we are. Your ears haven't heard the blessings and the power and the anointing that I have available for you. Right here, right now, in this world. 1 Kings 17, verses 8 through 13. 1 Kings 17, verses 8 through 13. Praise the Lord. And uh, we all need, know these stories. We've seen them many times, I'm sure, and heard plenty of sermons preached about them. But uh, 1 Kings 17, That's it. 8 oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Eight, yeah. through 13. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, sorry. Praise the Lord. Yes. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get yeah, thee to that's Seraphim. What I had okay. Praise the Lord. Arise, get thee to Seraphath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Seraphath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son." So Elijah says here, okay, here's a different plan. Take your oil, take your meal, and make me a cake first. Now let's look at 1 Peter 1, verse 7. 1 The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes. Praise the Lord. Matthew 6, 33. So he says, uh, make me a cake first. And here in Matthew 33, it says, Jesus, and it was spoken earlier, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. There's priority given to the word first. And it's all through scripture. Make me a cake first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Think about it. Scripturally speaking, only the firstborn, the first fruit, the first tenth have redemptive power. Amen? They have redemptive power over everything else. 1 Kings 17, let's go back there again, verse 14 through 16.
For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. For thus saith the Lord, you got that, right? For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. She gave and she lived. She understood the power of a crumb. Yeah. Remember, this is a word from the Lord. She took that crumb that she had and by faith gave it to God based on what the word of God had told her. The crumbs from that barrel taught not only the woman, but the prophet himself. A great lesson in faith, a great opportunity to see the hand of God move in their lives. Elijah remembered those crumbs, and he parlayed them into such faith that he reached up without hands and grabbed a cloud in the sky and pulled it over Israel and held on to it until it became a rainstorm. Because God told him, if you'll say it, I'll do it. That Syrophoenician woman's attitude, her ability to find a crumb of faith in the truth that was spoken to her, was power to hold on to. It made Jesus say, great is thy faith. Be it unto you even as you have believed. Luke 18, 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. This is exactly what Don was talking about, Tim, and everyone that spoke here this morning. A simple word study shows that the faith he's looking for Right here on earth, or the world, you could say, is the faith that his church has in him. The faith that the body of Christ has in their head. That's what he's looking for. Believe me, he's not expecting every politician to jump up and start praising the Lord. But he is expecting his church to stand up for what's right and what's true in spite of the politicians, in spite of everybody else, or anybody else for that matter. See, if you look at the parable just before this, look, in fact, let's go back to uh, Luke 18, 1 through 7. And you'll see how he makes sense out of this or, or makes it make more sense to us today. Because he says, uh, beginning in verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Praise the Lord. The real question is, when the Son of Man comes, will he find persevering faith? Will he find people who have faith in trials? People who have faith when the situations are telling you it can't happen, it won't happen, it's not going to work out. That's the faith he's looking for. He's looking for faith that perseveres. Not faith in a moment and then we get our goody and, and we're all forgotten about it. But it's like Tim was talking about. That's what he was looking for in Israel was persevering faith. He gave them reasons to have faith, but their faith never persevered. It only lasted for the moment of the miracle. And then they're falling right back into the same old, oh no, what are we going to do now? without thinking that God is capable of doing anything and everything that they need. Yes. And, it, and it's not that God gets mad at them, it's just that God can only operate by faith. Yes. Praise the Lord. We're talking about 
a crumb that we can hold on to until the whole loaf is in our hands. The way we move this mess, the way we, is to hold on to the faith that God has given us already until we have the whole answer, until we have it all. We believe just with the crumb, just a word. By his stripes you were healed. Amen? He took our sins. We, gotta hang, we have to hang on to these promises, onto these crumbs, until we see the full loaf, until we get the whole package. Because that's how we get it. That's the only way it works. That woman had a little bit. If she'd, had, if she'd have used it up without giving, without putting confidence in God first, she'd have starved to death just like she had already admitted that was going to happen. But because she put what God's word had been first, she was taken care of throughout the entire thing until God actually brought the answer to the problem, which was not just sustaining them, but giving them ongoing life through the rain, through the ending of the, of the uh, drought and the uh, st starvation and so forth that was taking place at the time. Look at, let's look at, in, in fact, we don't have to turn there because you all are familiar with Hebrews 11. It's called the chapter of faith. By faith, God. And then he goes on and tells us of all these people who saw miraculous things take place in their lives. By faith, simply by faith, simply by believing what God had said. The people just like you and me, cut from the same human condition, ex-prostitutes, murderers, drunkards, liars, thieves, cheats. Everybody listed in that chapter had skeletons in their closet. They had hang-ups. They had tragedies. They had unquestionable mistakes in their lives. And yet they became trophies of grace they discovered the power of a crumb, a crumb of faith, a crumb of hope, a crumb of grace. All Abraham had was a crumb. When he was Abram, his father Terah was an idol maker. He worshipped multiple false gods. Abraham heard a voice one day in Genesis 12, 1, Get thee out from among thy kindred to a land I'll show thee. He didn't have a map. He didn't have GPS. He didn't know where he was going. How long it would take to get there. He just knew he had a word from the Lord. And then he didn't hear that word again. Or a voice from God for years. On the basis of that one crumb. He literally walked off the map. He went forth not knowing, the scripture says, where he was going, but knowing who he was following. He did it with the power of a crumb. In Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. From that one man, that one man that God took from the Euphrates River, from Ur of the Chaldees, a place whose name means the flames of destruction. He took him from the flames of destruction. Fire and light. From that one man, God raised a nation. From that nation, God took a tribe. From that tribe, God took one lineage, the lineage of David. And from that lineage, God brought forth one man whose blood atones for the sins of the world. You can trace it all back to one man. One man who took hold of a crumb and held on to it until it became the bread of life. We're living in an age of crisis, and that doesn't come as any revelation to anybody. We need to be people who move by faith. We have his spirit. We have his word. We have his name. We have thousands of angels at our disposal. It's the whole loaf. The Syrophoenician mother claimed two words, truth and dogs. And with those two words, a devil was cast out from her daughter, and the girl was restored to her right mind. 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2.
Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Power of a crumb. Look what the woman did with the little face she had. Truth, master, but the puppies get the crumbs. We've been given more than crumbs because we're better than dogs. The children's portion is the whole loaf. How can we not be thankful? How can we not give thanks to the Lord? Give thanks to the Lord, all ye his people. Praise the Lord. God's telling us, be thankful, even if you can't see what you're thankful for yet, because it's yours, and you will experience it. You may be holding on to a crumb today, just enough to keep you holding on, but hang on to that crumb. Because that's what takes you to the whole loaf. It's what will get you to everything Jesus has promised us. For ourselves personally, for our families, for our nation, and for this world. In Jesus' name. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. I'm going to pray now before we go downstairs and eat the turkey. Praise God. Father, we just are so grateful to you for everything that we have, especially you. For without you, nothing would matter. Nothing would have value. But because of you, even the negative things in our lives can bring forth positive. They can show you mighty on our behalf. And we are eternally grateful, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy toward us. And we give thanks today, as every day, but specifically on this day, we choose to tell you how much you mean to us and to this nation. And we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's enjoy the turkey. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.